Okay, welcome everyone to this second session of the day. Uh, the talk will be by uh, Dan Morley, uh, who will speak about Marxism versus postmodernism. Just to let everyone uh, know, in case there's some new people uh, listening and watching. The reason why the speakers will be pausing is because this meeting is being translated into 12 or 13 different languages. So the speaker will speak for one sentence and then we'll pause for translation. That's the reason. The, ma the main theme of this uh, international Marxist university is uh, the defense of Marxist ideas. And because of this, this particular talk is so important. Postmodernism is the, one of the main strands of bourgeois ideology. Which is behind many of the reactionary ideas which dominate academia and intellectual circles. For this reason, if you are sick and tired of hearing about narratives, if you don't know how to pronounce uh, the, the name of the French philosopher Foucault, but uh, you don't like his ideas, you are in the right talk. So without any more uh, announcements, I will uh, allow uh, Dan to speak. He will speak for 45 minutes plus translation. There will then be a break and then there will be some interventions. And we aim to finish this meeting at 9 p.m. British time. With a summing up by uh, Dan himself. So I'm going to unmute Dan. Uh, Dan, you need to accept the unmute request. Okay. So long as capitalism exists, there will be an ideological battle waged against Marxism on behalf of the capitalists. Whereas in the 19th century, the defense of capitalism was very direct. Capitalism was described as a, the best system that it was liberating humanity, bringing about freedom and prosperity. By the 20th century, that was no longer really tenable. And so the main defenses, the different defenses of capitalism in the 20th century took a very indirect character.
not only admitting the horrors of capitalism, but to a certain extent, even emphasizing the oppression that capitalism produces. And, but in such a way as to give the impression that it was impossible to, to, do, to have a different kind of society or to understand the source of these oppressions. And postmodernism is one of these uh, trends in bourgeois philosophy, and these days it is the dominant one. And it is, in reality, directed chiefly against Marxism. Its basic ideas are the rejection of the possibility or even the desirability of progress for humanity. and the rejection of the possibility of objective knowledge, of, of the ability to describe the world as it really is, or even whether there is such a world is rejected. And it is therefore an idealist philosophy. In other words, for postmodernism, consciousness is independent of the material world, or rather the material world has no independence from consciousness. Right. Whereas Marxism is thoroughly materialist. In other words, for us, the material world is the only world that exists and human thought or consciousness is a particular expression of that material world and cannot be independent of it. Now, the idealism of postmodernism fits into a broader trend, the same trend I've already been discussing, um, that we can call irrationalism. This was a, the dominant trend um, throughout the different trends of bourgeois philosophy in the 20th century. And we have many different schools of it. For example, in the United States, pragmatism. We have uh, imperio criticism that Lenin famously criticized. And we also have the phenomenology of Husserl and Heidegger. And these uh, postmodernism is, is in fundamental agreement with all of these, which essentially say that is a kind of shame faced idealism. It masks its idealism by saying that the material world does exist. However, it's just as um, consciousness is dependent upon the material world, which they admit, so the material world is dependent upon consciousness and the two cannot be separated.
this is a fundamentally idealist position because it denies the independence of the materialist world. The main reason, well, there's really two main reasons for this, which I'll discuss. The first main reason for this dominate, dominant trend in bourgeois philosophy in the 20th century is that by the 20th century, human knowledge had advanced to the point where the world was so complex and so contradictory that it baffled the, the, the typical bourgeois philosopher from their individualistic and ahistorical standpoints. not only in natural science, but also the human sciences like archaeology, anthropology, all of these reveal the staggering complexity of nature and human society, the many sided character of it. Um, and as a result, the many bourgeois philosophers and scientists kind of just sort of gave up in a sense. What was needed to understand this complexity and contradictoriness was a dialectical philosophy which embraces the ideas of contradiction, history and change. But bourgeois philosophy stopped at that threshold, it turned back and it fell a very long way. It fell back into a, an individualism, but whereas before the individualism of the early bourgeoisie was optimistic and based on the idea that the individual through their selfishness will help build a, a better, a richer world. The individualism instead of the 20th century was one of cynicism, pessimism, and decadence. And in particular, they, they, the bourgeoisie lost confidence in, in, the, in generalization, basically, in the ability to comprehend with one fundamental theory, many different contradictory things. <clears throat> But there was another uh, reason, a political reason for this, um, this decline of bourgeois philosophy. Which is the rise of the working class. By the early 20th century, the working class was increasingly organized and it had its own ideology. And this, and this ideology, which is Marxism, <clears throat> it, 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 um, it, it took up the mantle of, of science and the belief in progress and, and human emancipation.
And because by the early 20th century, it was too, too big a phenomenon for, for, for the reactionaries to ignore, they had to discredit it. So for them, the, um, pr the ideas of progress and science and materialism were tainted by association with Marxism. And this is really the kind of equivalent process to an economics where the bourgeoisie abandoned the labor theory of value because that too became too strongly associated with Marxism. Dan, 10 minutes gone, 80 minutes to go. And this, this um, need to discredit the idea of progress is, is perhaps uh, best expressed uh, with Nietzsche. <clears throat> Who is an extremely reactionary philosopher and insisted that the bourgeoisie or the ruling class must crush the working class and crush any idea of equality. And it's very telling that he is po possibly the, the most influential philosopher for the postmodernists, in particular for Foucault. <clears throat> now, of course, most of the philosophers um, of, if you like, or most of the what we call bourgeois philosophers are in reality actually petty bourgeois in their own personal backgrounds. And this uh, social position makes them perfectly suited for this role of developing a, a deeply pessimistic philosophy. <clears throat> because in general, the petty bourgeoisie is acutely aware of the horrors of capitalism and they find its culture, they typically, especially petty bourgeois intellectuals, they find capitalism's culture crude, you know, and uh, distasteful. But at the same time, in, unless they come over to the side of the working class, which of course some do, they view the working class with contempt and they view mass organizations as a kind of uh, horrifying because intellectual individuals such as themselves seem to be relatively insignificant in that world. Now I want to discuss the um, Frankfurt School briefly because I think that they are very influential over postmodernism as well. <clears throat> now, if you study Marxism at university, you'll probably be told that the Frankfurt School are Marxists. <clears throat> Uh, but in reality, they, they are not Marxists at all, as I think I will explain. And although they are officially not considered postmodernists at all, that the, the similarity in their ideas, uh, and in particular the main themes, uh, is, is really striking.
And that's important to emphasize because I don't think we should look at postmodernism as just the sort of strict discipline of, you know, the few philosophers who are officially labeled postmodernists. It's part of a far broader trend in bourgeois society. <clears throat> And the Frankfurt School also highlights one of the other major uh, causes of postmodernism. <clears throat> which is the horrors of capitalism in the 20th century and specifically the failure of various revolutions. So just as the failure of the German revolution was hugely influential over the Frankfurt School, so the failure of revolutions such as uh, those in 68 are hugely influential for the postmodernists. <clears throat> Now, just like the postmodernists, the main theme of the Frankfurt School is extreme pessimism, a contempt for the working class, and uh, basically a denial of the possibility of human emancipation. <clears throat> And this flows from their position in society because the Frankfurt School, just like the postmodernists, is a purely academic phenomenon. They at no point did any of the members of the Frankfurt School join uh, a political party or participate in the struggle of the working class. even though all of them were German and came of age in the middle of the German revolution. The closest thing I could find is that Marcuse, who is one of its most famous members, briefly joined the SPD at the end of the German revolution. In other words, he joined a reformist party precisely at the point when it had just betrayed the German working class. About four or five years after the failure of the German revolution, or rather its defeat, um, uh, Horkheimer, who is one of the most prominent members of the Frankfurt School, wrote uh, an article called The Impotence of the German Working Class. Now, you might expect that that article being written only just after the German Revolution would analyze the events of the German Revolution. It doesn't say anything about what happened in the German Revolution. The only thing it says is that the German workers are inherently divided and are incapable of attaining to revolutionary consciousness. It 
even though only four years earlier they had been fighting for power, establishing workers' councils all over the country and, and, and organizing revolutionary general strikes. Similarly, in the 1969 preface to their book, Dialectic of Enlightenment, they talk about how the working class of the Western world is incapable of, uh, of any revolutionary consciousness or really of doing anything political. you know, because they had too many luxury commodities, for example. But they wrote this one year after 1968 and the biggest general strike in history in France and many other revolutionary events throughout the world. <clears throat> And this book uh, is, you know, it could pretty much be a postmodernist book, even though it isn't considered uh, an example of postmodernism. Its argument is that the Enlightenment um, is, in, it, the idea of the Enlightenment is about freeing humanity by mastering nature. 20 minutes done. Um, and th this morphs, it aut sort of automatically morphs into oppression of humanity because the idea of dominating nature to liberate humanity very easily becomes the idea of dominating other humans. And so for them, the main reason that uh, they, and they state it explicitly, the reason for the Holocaust is because the ideas of the Enlightenment inherently leads to the, the desire to oppress people. Now it's clear, It is clearly a thoroughly idealist and non-Marxist outlook because the entire basis of the argument is the nature of the ideas of the Enlightenment. <clears throat> and, um, and you would also think that given these people are allegedly Marxists, you would think that from this argument that no Marxist had ever had anything to say about the limitations of the Enlightenment and the bourgeois revolution. Whereas an absolutely key foundational part of the writings of Marx and Engels is the criticism of the ideas of the Enlightenment and revealing how, because of the materialist, the material character of bourgeois society, the ideas, in other words, human freedom, reason, etc., the ideas of the Enlightenment could not be realized. And one final thing on, on, on the uh, Frankfurt School, just to return to their, um, their, their um, petty bourgeois character and their contempt for the working class. <clears throat> the Frankfurt School itself was founded by uh, a couple of businessmen, you know, left-wing businessmen with the idea, not that it would help you know, the, the socialist movement and the workers' struggle, but that it would, you know, develop the study of society for the sake of it. <clears throat> um, 
And the school itself had a long tradition of working for bourgeois governments. <clears throat> In fact, Henrik Grossman, its founder, actually worked for the Austrian government and gave them the briefings that they needed for the Brest-Litovsk Treaty when they were negotiating with the Bolsheviks. <clears throat> In the Second World War, they worked for the, the American government and after the Second World War, uh, Horkheimer would routinely edit out any mention of the word Marxism or revolution from any of their publications because he was worried that their contract with the D German Ministry of Defense would not come through as a result. <clears throat> So it's very, very clear that their position in society and their, the, the dependence they had on, on money from the bourgeois state obviously restricted what they would and wouldn't say and think. And it gave them a kind of um, a, yeah, a contempt for the working class, basically. <clears throat> And this is the same with the, with the postmodernists, which is equally a thoroughly academic phenomenon. What I, always find, what I always find amusing about this is that the postmodernists emphasize that all institutions, even institutions we'd never thought of before, have um, power structures contained with them and inherently are oppressive. <clears throat> Except apparently the university. Which obviously paid their wages. Now, um, I'll go on to talk directly about the main postmodernists now. <clears throat> As I've said, they, they completely rejected uh, any ideology of progress or belief in human emancipation. in really the exact same way as the Frankfurt School. And they see, just like the Frankfurt School, they also see oppression everywhere. <clears throat> and they are also define themselves in this respect um, against what they term modernism. And this is again is similar to the Frankfurt School because the Frankfurt School, of course, sort of ign ignore the Marxist criticism, if you like, of the ideas of the liberal ideas of the Enlightenment. <clears throat> And similarly, the postmodernists, um, for them, liberalism and Marxism are the same thing. They ignore the, completely that there's a difference between the two, because for them, the two of them are basically modernist, which means both of them believe in science and the possibility of human progress. <clears throat> Thank you.
and they caricature Marxists as if we think that with each passing year, every year just gets better and better, as, as if we don't understand that the bourgeoisie is a reactionary class and will use technology and science to oppress humanity so long as they exist. <clears throat> so what what all of these ideologies do reflect which is true in a sense is that that progress has stalled yes but it is progress under capitalism they blur over the class distinctions and just treat that as if that is you know sums up humanity's lot forever there, there will be no progress and all humans will oppress other humans <clears throat> 30 minutes then And what they, they, they describe this as, uh, in, in Lyotard's words, Lyotard was a, a, um, a prominent postmodernist, they describe this attitude as incredulity towards meta-narratives. A meta narrative means, in, in their, as they, this is obviously their term, not ours, but it means any ideology or theory that it attempts to explain a broad process rather than just small, isolated phenomena. <clears throat> So, so the philosophical basis of their rejection of, of the possibility of progress lies in this, this, this rejection of the ability of humans to understand and to explain um, phenomena. They have another word for this, which is essentialist. So for them, any theory is essentialist if it states that it understands the underlying reason, or in other words, the essence of a given phenomenon. <clears throat> So they would argue that it is essentialist when Marx and Engels state that the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggles. Or to emphasize the centrality of the productive forces in determining the development of human society. So what they would say is that it's very naive and arrogant to think that we can explain such complex phenomena as society. And so for them, you know, um, modernism, in other words, liberalism and Marxism, which they lump together, uh, both of them have this arrogance of, of and, and this naivety of thinking that we're just going to, we've understood history and, and we can explain it and we know that how we're going to liberate ourselves. <clears throat> Uh, 
I can understand, of course, why some people find this a compelling argument. Because, of course, society is indeed very, very complex. And of course, a lot of uh, people do make bad generalizations and, you know, have, you know, they, they don't back their generalizations up sufficiently, basically. <clears throat> and indeed, many old theories of how humanity would develop have been proven to be wrong. <clears throat> And you also have to bear in mind that the postmodernists were, a lot of them were, they're pretty much all, all of the original ones were French, and a lot of them were in or around the French Communist Party, which was thoroughly Stalinist. So the version of Marxism that they had before their eyes and that they were arguing against was in reality not Marxism at all. It was a crude mechanical caricature of Marxism. <clears throat> Although at first glance it may seem like quite a wise um, insight, as soon as you begin to grapple with these ideas, they basically begin to reveal their uselessness. So if we take the example of um, uh, what is called queer theory, which we're having a session on this week as well, <clears throat> It's concerned with sexual oppression. But it argues that like, we cannot say it, what the underlying cause of sexual oppression or the sexual norms that we have are. And uh, it's, you know, it would be arrogant to, to try and give it such an answer. <clears throat> So the explanation that is put forward um, is that there's no fundamental reason for these sexual norms. It's just that this or that person performs, and that is the word they use, performs a gender role. And that I emphasize the word perform because it, it's obviously used to, to give the impression that it's non-essential, that it's an act essentially. <clears throat> And, um, <clears throat> and when, once somebody performs that role, perhaps their children see that performance and they think that that's normal, so they copy it. And by means of that, we have this kind of vast web of overlapping performances and a, a particular norm arises out of that, which basically may or may not have happened. It, it's, it's completely accidental, essentially. <clears throat> Now, what they say is that to, to say that there's an underlying reason for this particular sexual norm dominating is to kind of treat it in a mystical way because you're, you're treating the, the cause um, as prior to and external to society and then somehow imposing itself onto society.
But the materialist philosophy of Marxism tells us that although there are laws, of course, um, there are laws to human society and all, all natural phenomena, but they don't exist outside of the phenomena itself. They, they are a product of the, the, the necessity of all of the parts interacting in the way that they do. <clears throat> And at the end of the day, this comes down to the, exist the independent existence of the material world, which we all inhabit. And 40 minutes. The fact that we need to survive, that we need to produce everything that we live off, that obliges us to enter into definite relations with one another that we cannot simply opt out of. And that is the reason that human society has the different laws that it has that we can explain. <clears throat> But the complete denial or, or ignoring of this fact leads to um, an arbitrariness to their idea, to the ideas of the postmodernist, and in particular, in this case, the queer theorists, and uh, the problem of infinite regression. <clears throat> infinite regression. <clears throat> In other words, um, there's no ability to understand any starting point or any reason that any of this has happened. It, it could have happened in any other way, basically, and it's arbitrary, therefore. And so at best, this is reduced to mere description of the different phenomena that we find in society without any understanding of the reason for them. In practice, this philosophy just ends up producing lists of, of oppressions and different grievances without any explanation. <clears throat> and therefore there's no solution either, or if there is, it's impossible to know what that is. And we can see this very clearly with modern day identity politics. Which, you know, if I'm sure people are, have, have noticed this themselves, it just, it presents itself to you as just an, en an endless list of new bad kinds of behavior that have been discovered and uh, people must just be told not to do without any understanding of why it's happening. So a few years ago, we had the, the idea spreading around of, of man spreading, you know, where that was identified as a problem that arrogant men spread their legs too far when they're sitting down. <clears throat> 
today the latest one seems to be the Karen, you know, the person who, uh, the white woman who is very bossy in shops. <clears throat> And that seems to be all that this philosophy produces in terms of politics. It's just a list, an ever list growing list of think pieces and articles saying, oh, this is uh, this kind of person is, is very annoying or oppressive, aren't they? And of course, some of them are true and they, they are problems, but there's no there's no explanation or understanding present at all. <clears throat> and so ironically they end up actually essentializing oppression and, and making it seem completely natural and unavoidable because they have no explanation for it Certainly to me, the, that is the impression that one gets. And reading all of these articles, you just sort of get inundated with all of these very depressing things with no sense of a solution. And the conclusion that you're kind of tempted to draw from it is that, well, this is just how humans are. They're just really unpleasant to, to each other all the time. And this isn't just a case of, you know, um, people misinterpreting the actual philosophers ideas. This is pretty much what the philosophers themselves put forwards. So Judith Butler, the, the most prominent person in queer theory, she puts forward the idea that um, what we should do is just sort of parody in, on an individual level, just sort of parody the sexual norms that we find oppressive. That's it. That's basically the prognosis of what to do. <clears throat> well, or for Deleuze and Guattari, who are two um, prominent uh, French um, postmodernists who work together, for them, the source of all oppression is, is kind of um, hierarchies of ideas. So theories that attempt to say this is correct and that's incorrect, because that's oppressive and it sets up taboos. So their, but their response to this is therefore to say, well, because thought is bound up in all of these kind of hierarchies, which are inherently oppressive, we should escape thought. So they actually started celebrating schizophrenics and they argued that if we just follow the desires of our body rather than of our thoughts, then that's, that might be the path to freedom. So, um, and I'm just going to read out a quotation from Lyotard. Uh, who's, um, this is his sort of um, response, very similar to Deleuze and Guattari. He also finds language and thoughts inherently oppressive. Um, so his response is essentially to escape thought, and I'll just uh, read out his, his quotation to give you a flavour. Dan, 50 minutes. 
Okay, he's. Okay, he says, <clears throat> holding up production, uncompensated seizures as modalities of consumption, refusal. Refusal to work, in inverted commas, communities, happenings, sexual lib movements, occupations, squattings, abductions, productions of sounds, words, colors with no artistic intention. Here are the men of production, the masters of today. Marginals, experimental painters, pop, hippies and yippies, parasites, madmen, binned loonies. One hour of their lives offers more intensity and less intention than 300,000 words of a professional philosopher. I think we can all... Okay. I think, um, <clears throat> I think we can all agree that one hour of almost anyone's life is worth more than any of the writing of this particular philosopher, if we can call him that. And on the basis of this philosophy, it's, it's although it, direct, it typically directs itself against oppression and things like racism and imperialism, it's unclear why any particular ideology should ever be rejected. Because for them, uh, the ideas and the ideology of any given society, all of them are just relative. Like none can be described as objectively true because to say something is objectively true and is the correct idea is actually oppressive itself. So why... So there's no real foundation actually for rejecting any particular idea, even the ideas of fascism. Um, <clears throat> and what's really stands out with all of this writing is, is the inherent the kind of incredible, uh, incredibly flippant character of it. It's, I think it's the, um, I think the role that it serves and has served is to, obviously, as I said, discredit the idea of progress and in doing so to take intellectuals who could actually be one to, to Marxism or to, to the cause of the working class and take them down these harmless paths, these illusory paths, basically. And I th also think that it can get away with such um, badly argued and sh um, shoddily written stuff because basically it serves the interests of the powerful.
basically it's harmless. It's completely harmless to the powerful. And so in the 70s and in the 80s, this, and, and even more so in the 90s, this kind of outlook was promoted and, and, and all of these texts got churned out because in my opinion, it, it served a very useful purpose, which is discrediting the idea of revolution and of Marxist theory. And it, end, it ends up, you know, coming to these ridiculous conclusions. And I'll just give one last uh, quotation while I'm discussing this, this part of it. This is from Baudrillard, who's another postmodern, French postmodernist. The quotation is not actually from him, but he, he, he was very fond of quoting it and he took it and he adapted it and changed it to make it more overtly postmodernist. So it is effectively his own words. And he says, beyond a certain precise moment in time, History is no longer real. Without realizing it, the whole human race suddenly left reality behind. Nothing that has occurred since then has been true. But we are unable to realize it. Our task and our duty now is to discover this point or so long as we fail to grasp it, we are condemned to continue on our present destructive course. And this brings me on to the final um, aspect of postmodernism that I want to discuss. which brings me on to its, its paradoxical character. It's the self-contradiction at the heart of it. This absurd claim that reality has now been departed from and nothing is, is true. This is obviously nonsense and it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it contradicts itself in its own stating. For something to no longer be true, obviously requires there to be a reality that it is in contradiction with. The only basis of the anything being true or false is the whether or not it agrees with objective reality, with the material world, essentially. And also, the two other parts of it make the same kind of bizarre mistake, such as, um, you know, at a, he says, at a certain precise moment in time, in other words, time is real, but then the entirety of his philosophy is dedicated to the denial of history and of, of objective time. Um, and this reminds me of the paradox of the solipsist. A 
solipsist is somebody who um, argues that the external world simply does not exist. Everything is a projection of your own imagination, your own consciousness. But anybody who advocates this, and there are people who have advocated it, is inherently absurd and contradicting themselves. Of course, they contradict themselves in practice with every moment of their daily life, whether it's when they choose to eat, when it's when they look before they cross the road, they demonstrate that actually they really do believe in an independent material reality. Dan, 60 minutes gone, 30 minutes left. And can you please make shorter sentences if possible? Okay. Not only that, but the person who is making this uh, argument is going to the effort of writing an entire book and, and getting people to read that book in an attempt to convince them that they themselves do not exist. It's all, it's... <clears throat> By denying generalization or essentialism, in, in other words, any attempt to explain the general features of reality, um, they are falling into this kind of paradox. I'll give you some examples from the conclusions that they draw and the kind of political, uh, you know, the, the political outcome of their uh, or political conclusions of their philosophies. Now, Foucault is probably the most in influential postmodernist. And as a result of his rejection of essentialism or meta-narratives, instead of developing a new theory about the nature of society and the laws of society and etc., he dedicated himself to studying the history of oppression in different institutions like the prison system, mental, uh, you know, mental health or psychiatry, etc. And summing up his uh, his philosophy. In this respect, he said the following. There is no locus of great refusal. No soul of revolt. Source of all rebellions. or pure law of the revolutionary. Instead, there is a plurality of resistances, each of them a special case. And so in other words, we have no idea how emancipation could possibly ever be attained because there's just so many different kinds of uh, struggle for liberation. Each one of them has really nothing to do with any of the others.
Now, first of all, where do you draw the line at generalization? What Foucault seems to be saying is that you cannot generalize the whole of society. You cannot generalize across all of the struggles. You can only you know, dis dis discuss the individual struggles. But then surely when you're discussing the prison system or psychiatry and the treatment of, of, of um, mental health, surely that also inherently involves quite a lot of generalization. Across many different countries and centuries. Why is that kind of essentialism okay? And the statement itself unavoidably is a general statement about society. As he says, there is no locus of great refusal. There is no soul of revolt. Therefore, unconsciously, he is stating a general state of affairs or making a claim about the nature of society as a whole. But, it, but it's one that he never justifies or he never explains why there isn't or can't be any sort of general logic or law to a revolution or anything else across the whole of society. Moreover, he is making an even more explicit um, claim about the nature of society across his work. which is that for him, the essential defining feature of all social relationships is power and domination. Only for some reason in each case, power is slightly different in each social institution and somehow never manages to develop a general character. Not only is that a generalization, but it's a very poorly argued one with no real facts or evidence to back it up. You know, why is power the general feature of society and not, you know, economic relations, for example? And what is power anyway? This is a completely abstract, the worst kind of generalization, the void of any content, just a, a, you know, totally abstract. And he avoids having to tackle that, of course, by only focusing separately on each individual case of power in different institutions. But he does then conclude that power is general to all social phenomena is the most important question for some reason. It's never explained.
And this problem is, is, is found in all of the postmodern philosophers. In queer theory, it is uh, sexual oppression that is focused on. And uh, it's declared that sexual oppression has this form, which is that it is performative. It's, it's people acting in a certain way, playing a certain role. But why it is that way and not a product of material conditions, this is never explained. So this, so this is the worst kind of generalization, in other words. Um, and I could go on with many other examples. I'll just, just give a couple. With Deleuze and Guattari, who I've already mentioned. Uh, their, their argument is that um, we mustn't have generalizations because any thought that bases itself on generalizations creates hierarchies of ideas. This idea is correct, that idea is incorrect, and it therefore oppresses people who subscribe to different ideas, and therefore that is the source of oppression, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. 20 minutes left, Dan. But in doing so, they are claiming that they know the source of all oppression. In other words, they are making precisely the kind of generalization that they say is so bad to claim that they have the answer. And all the other theories about why we have oppression and inequality, those are wrong. It's, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a paradox, it's self-contradictory. Now, postmodernists sort of hold up essentialism or meta narratives as a very simplistic and naive thing yeah, and arrogance, you know, uh, people who think in that way sort of arrogantly think they have all of the answers. Well, there certainly are people who make very poor generalizations in an arrogant and a sloppy way. And I would argue that the faddish, trendy quality of postmodernism is a perfect example of that. Also, this, um, this outlook that you hear from postmodernists all the time, that it's very, Marxism, for example, is very simplistic because it's, it just reduces everything to, to, uh, to class, the class struggle. It's class reductionist, as they would say, and they say this is very simple. And this, 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 the uh, claim that is made is that instead we must have a very nuanced philosophy because reality is extremely complex. Although, as I've said, I don't think they themselves actually manage that because their own claims are very simplistic, very repetitive and very poorly argued.
Now we can all agree that society and the natural world are very, very complex things. I think we can say that humanity will never reach a point where we have answered everything and have, you know, understood everything about reality. However, the mere assertion that things are very, very complex is actually one sided. In reality, actually, the most complex phenomena can have quite simple laws governing them. The comprehension of those laws does not mean that you have a crystal ball and that you can predict everything that will happen. I'll give a couple of examples. Um, Darwin's theory of evolution. We can all agree that organic life is phenomenally complex and we are very far from having fully explained it. I think we can also agree that the basic idea of, um, of evolution, that is of, of natural selection um, through you know, um, different mutations from one generation to the next, there's a rather simple idea and is actually quite easy to explain and understand. Does that mean we should therefore dismiss it as old fashioned, um, uh, essentialist, simplistic, reductionist, etc.? And of course, understanding the basics of Darwinism does not mean you can just fold your arms, sit back and think that you've understood all of the organic world forever. And Marxism is like that. The basic ideas of historical materialism, for example, I think are quite easy to explain. The st statement such as the history of all uh, hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle does not mean you don't need to study those class struggles or that literally nothing else happens and nothing else has any influence on society. And this this dialectical contradiction between the simple and the complex we find across all of, all of the natural world. It is impossible to predict, with a complex system, it is impossible to predict the exact movement of any of the parts of that system. No one can predict exactly when somebody will die, for example. The healthiest person could die tomorrow in the most random and unexpected of ways.
but we can understand and predict very accurately the number of deaths in a given country in a given year. Which of course, which of course is something that has been used to show up the lie that the government statistics on the number of people who died from coronavirus. You can only do that because of the reliability of that, that basic fact. <clears throat> ten minutes, then. ten minutes left. Human society is ultimately a natural thing. It's humans are physical, natural beings. We are animals. Whilst it clearly has its own laws, the idea that it should be fundamentally inexplicable in how it develops is um, completely unscientific and, and actually very, very outdated. And despite the complexity of capitalist society, it certainly does have predictable laws, such as capitalist crises and political revolutions or social revolutions. And nobody, no Marxist thinks that they know when the next revolution is coming or exactly when and where, it, how it will happen. But we do, we can say with certainty, looking at the history of capitalism, that these are regular features of capitalist society. Not only that, we can also explain why they happen. And it is the job and the duty of Marxists to painstakingly study the history of the re of revolutions, the history of the working class, the, the laws of the capitalist uh, economic system, etc. And there is and there's no other political organization in the world besides the IMT that puts such a high emphasis on carefully, on all of its members, carefully um, discussing and studying the history of the workers' movement, etc. Marxist theory, basically. And we should, and by the way, we should come out in defense of generalization. <clears throat> Just to go back to the earlier points about the paradoxical character of, of postmodernism in denying generalization, but making generalizations whilst they do it. Not only is their position anti-philosophy, which is all about discovering these things, but it's anti-human thought. You cannot actually have a thought without generalizing. This is what all thought is based upon. If I say, you know, I am a man, or this is a table, or, this is a piece of paper, these are generalizations. The table is, of course, different to all other tables. So how can I use that term?
So we should, you know, there's no point in denying this. <clears throat> Five minutes then. What we need is to base ourselves on, on accurate um, and accurate information and, and, and um, the best theoretical generalizations uh, rather than rubbishing them, but at the same time actually making generalizations, which is, is absurd. And finally, you cannot hope to fight oppression with a pessimistic, pessimistic attitude. Indeed, I think it's dishonest and, um, and irresponsible actually to, to, to dedicate your entire philosophy to the discussion and the study of oppression in all of its forms, but then deny the ability to understand it and to do anything about it. And for revolutionaries or anybody seriously interested in ending oppression and emancipating humanity, Marxism is indispensable. Because our optimism isn't arbitrary, but it is based on a thorough materialism and a method. And hasn't humanity plumbed the depths of all of the mysteries that surround us and begin, began to solve one after another all of these mysteries? And haven't we proved the validity of these generalizations and theories not only in, in theory, but in practice by transforming the world and society around us. And haven't these discoveries and this technology laid the basis for a society in which nobody has to go hungry, nobody needs to die of an unnecessary disease, and nobody should live without a home. Two minutes. And also, haven't we, as a, as a class, in countless times, risen up to fight against capitalism and to challenge this capitalist system as a whole. So we should have tremendous confidence in our ability to understand things and to change the world for the better. Of course, what is holding us back in general is the capitalist system. But more specifically also the ability to transfer this scientific method to our own society, to our own social organism. to examine it, to, to, to see how it works, to see what the problems are, and to propose clear solutions and to set about putting those solutions into practice so that we can live better. But the middle-class academics of postmodernism stand at the threshold of the struggle to apply a scientific approach to society.
And they say to us, do not pass, do not even try to do this. In fact, it's dangerous if you do so. Or maybe it's a bit dangerous for them because they have a lot to lose. But the working class has nothing to lose but its chains and a world to win. <laughs> 